started. Um, and for those of you um, who have the text, um, it's this is page 21. I'm just this is just an opening reading for us. Um, and actually, both our opening and our closing reading both come from this page. It's the it's the opening of the governance section of the report. And this comes from Dr. Cornell West. And this was from 2015 when he gave the Ware Lecture, which is the annual lecture that has been occurring since 1832 with only, I think three years it didn't happen. I think mostly due to warfare. Um, um, and it's when we bring somebody from outside Unitarian Universalism, usually someone from outside um, to speak to us uh, about how they see us in the world uh, in that moment. And, this, and so Cornell West was the Ware lecturer at the 2015 General Assembly. And he speaks here, um, this was uh, not terribly long after, what, after the horrible murder in, at Mother Bethel in Charleston when uh, many of those African-American church members during a Bible study were massacred by a white supremacist, a crazy person. Um, uh, and so I just say that because he references it at the end of this quote. So I didn't want you to be confused about what he was speaking about when we get there. And so, so Dr. West says, I just want to be personal tonight because I come from a black people for 400 years terrorized, traumatized, stigmatized. But the best of our black tradition is what? It's generating the love supreme of a John Coltrane, the love ethic of a Martin Luther King Jr., the love sensibility of a Frederick Douglass and an Ida B. Wells Barnett, and in the music of a Stevie Wonder. What is it about these people that in the face of being terrorized, they continuously dish the love well, that's partly what Charleston is all about. These folk don't just fall from the sky. They come out of a deep tradition, fundamentally committed to love in the end, no matter what the situation is. And that's Dr. West. And Dr. West was referring in part, if you all may remember, but every member of Mother Bethel from Charleston went out of their way to say that they didn't hold hatred in their heart for the killer, right? So th that's, that's the backdrop, the, 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 the civic backdrop of West's remarks on here. Tonight, we begin with the governance section of this, of this text. Um, and, and I will reference pages where I have them I will share things on the screen as it's easy to do so. Um, so the, the beginning of the governance section is particularly dry for those of you who aren't deeply ingrained in or excited by uh, Unitarian Universalist uh, bylaws and practices. Even those who are involved in it aren't normally excited by all every aspect of these practices but they are our rules and our covenant for behaving well together and, re, and holding one another accountable. So I'm gonna to turn to page 28 and just share what I think is probably the most important thing for a congregation in this chapter in many ways. And what they're speaking to is informal structures of power. Informal structures of power are those places of power where folks have authority and power, but may not actually have been elected to a position of leadership in the congregation. And there are some unfortunate aspects of this. And, it's, and, and when informal structures of power are allowed to accumulate and to rule, it, it becomes almost impossible for new folks who are duly elected by the congregational processes to actually lead the congregation. And so we're always on the lookout. Is there an informal power structure that's thwarting the expressed will of our democratic congregational life? 
And so here's what the institution um, publishes. It's, it's called Informal Structures Privilege Those Already in Power. In our work as the commission, we've found that an area in need of analysis is that of over-reliance on informal structures to carry out our governance, whether at the local, regional, or denominational level. Informal structures rely on social relationships and thus tend to privilege people from the dominant culture in a community or organization. In the interest of not being bureaucratic, quote unquote, we leave structures informal because, well, quote, we all know and trust one another, right? Informal structures also sometimes bypass adopted procedures, ratified policies, and accepted governing agreements. Personal relationships are central to the work of organizations, yes, but they should not be used instead of sound, accountable governance structures. When informal structures are prioritized, the end result is that those in power benefit from decision-making processes and arrangements that not only benefit their perspectives, but also are taken to be normal practices or the way things should be, or those who are wiser about how this congregation is supposed to act and do things have reminded us what we should do. That last is my addition to the commission. Further down, the commission writes, informal power structures also create difficulties when working toward transformation because they are taken to be part of the system as if they've been elected and agreed upon and voted upon, even though when they're not. So informal power structures are taken to be part of the system in and of themselves, and thus they're not seen for what they really are. They're shortcuts, or what, rather I would say violations of right governance. One sign of an informal structure can be when a longtime member says the process or policy um, doesn't apply or it's not written down because, well, this is the way we have always done things. So how many folks have ever heard in congregational life when asked about the way things are done? Well, we've always done it that way. I saw Francesca's hand and I see heads nodding. So it doesn't mean that if someone says we've already done things that way, that it's not written down somewhere as a policy or procedure, but that should be a flag to all of us um, in, in dismantling those informal power structures, which are a genuine hindrance to really a vibrant invitation to new folks, possibly with new and different identities that we want to incorporate into our working, um, it, it, th those hindrances will keep them out in ways that sound settled. Oh, well, you know, these folks who've been here, you know, for 30 years tell us this is the way it's done. So I guess there's no conversation about it, right? So that's the informal power piece. Um, I, I don't think I have anything else from this. Oh, the other thing that's important in this chapter uh, for congregational life, I believe is on page 32. And that's, that's a discussion about how to reorganize nominating and leadership development teams. And right, we're actually in the middle of that right now. Um, you know, my wife and co-minister and uh, your co-minister uh, uh, has been working with the nominating leadership development team on a new charge to make sure that their po policies and procedures and processes are well-documented and accountable because one thing we know in, in studies of congregational life is that you attract people to your community based in some significant measure, it's not the determining factor, by who your leadership is. So if folks from the various identities that people will say in a casual moment that we would like to have more of in our community, if they come in and see people like that have been you know, nurtured and trained and put into power, well, then they will know that we mean what we say. And we will benefit as an institution by having their perspectives be part of our decision-making processes. And so I'm not gonna read anything from this particular um, piece. I mean, it, it, and, and, and in many ways we're doing that right now. But one of the, 
one of the things that they're looking at is, is how do we um, codify the way that we court, invite, train, support, reward um, leadership um, that, that is outside of the dominant cultural norm. All right, so that's a piece of it. I'm gonna share on the page here. Whoop -a -doo -doo -doo. I'm actually gonna just plop it into the chat. I'm pretty sure it'll all go there. And we'll go around and read it. So you guys just have to listen to my voice all night. Not that my voice doesn't sound great with this microphone, but you may just actually wanna hear somebody else's voice from time to time. Oh, it doesn't wanna put them all up. So I'm gonna do it as a screen share. Just give me a second to get back to that lovely page in the report. Um, and it's right here. It's the last page of this chapter. In the book, it's page 37, and it's called Takeaways. Um, all right, and let's see, view. I will zoom in a little bit because I know my eyes needed to be zoomed in. And here we go. So that we'll do this this way from now on. And I'm going to invite um, folks, um, just as I see them, to read these uh, takeaways. So Sue Parenti, please read the first one. Oh, make sure you're unmuted when you do that. I should know this. I'm on Zoom all day. <laughs> you probably had enough. That's probably what it is. <laughs> right. While at the local and regional level, our structures can be too informal, perpetuating a club-like mentality of leadership. Our overly complex governance system makes change difficult. So I'll stop there. Um, one of the things the commission found is that UUA processes are particularly complex. Um, and, and, and so we'll keep on going. So I wanted you to, to, to know what that's ref a reflection of. All right, Sarah Scalette. All right. Change, agility, and innovation are needed for Unitarian Universalism to survive. Common sense, right? Francesca. Black people, indigenous people, and people of color encounter ignorance and aggression in many Unitarian Universalist organizations. And the lack of a common commitment to anti-oppression and multicultural work make such service hazardous. We will be hearing more about that, I believe, next week when we engage the very heartbreaking chapter on uh, leaders of color in our association. Steve Ramsher. Um, thank you, but I'm not comfortable being recorded. Oh, sure, I'm sorry. So sorry, Steve. Um, Annalise. Uh, we have a history of disbanding bodies and then not reinstating them. As happened with our continental youth and young adult programs, we must address this need. So this refers, as you can see from the second half of that sentence, is we come up with these bright ideas and sometimes great programs. And then, you know, six, eight, 12 years later, there's a budget crisis and things get defunded. And, you know, sadly it's been um, not always the best discernment process as to what we fund and what we do not. Um, one other thing that this chapter has made clear is that we need to have better financial management of the Unitarian Universalist Association our annual meeting general assembly when it is in person is enormously expensive and as expensive as it is for us when we pay our you know our 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 fee it doesn't it doesn't cover it might cover half so every year we the, the UA has to dish out money that could be going to programming for a convention and and they still haven't figured that one out i i think the fact that this year we're going to have our second all virtual general assembly in a row is really going to help us hopefully conquer that particular issue. Um, so that's, that's a piece of that. Um, we talked last week about how there's often not as much money as people think that think there is or should be in the association. And in fact, the report itself talks a lot about funding this and funding that. Um, 
Uh, you know, but there's there's not a whole lot of dollars to fund anything. So that's a whole other conversation. If I can find a better way to speak about it in a couple of weeks, I will. I, I've been looking at some some resources about that. All right, let's move to the next one. Um, and that would be from my perspective, I think that's um, Debbie Ann for this one. I'm just going in the order I see people and I'll shake it up, make sure everybody gets a chance to talk. So Debbie Ann, we're on this one. We need a congregational policy that serves us rather than blocks pro progress. Mm -hmm. um, that's referring to uh, the notion that in the Cambridge platform of church discipline, which is the document from 1648 upon which a lot of our congregational polity is founded, um, congregations and individuals love the word autonomy, but don't like the word discipline. They love the word freedom, but they don't like the word collective action. And for really a, a century, or if not a century and a quarter, we have erred always on the freedom and the autonomy and have forgotten that we are all in this together and forgotten that we have an obligation to consider and then do the, exec, the, the collective action and programming we're asked to do. Um, so that's, that's a piece of our history too. And that has been changing in the last uh, six years, especially, but anyway. All right, uh, next on my screen is, uh, I believe, Norma Tassi. We need covenantal understandings among all affiliates, Unitarian Universalist organizations about the need for equality, inclusion, and diversity initiatives. Mm -hmm. And Ellie is the, got, the, got our last one here. We need to refocus the resources we have on critical areas of leadership that lead to more inclusive and equitable practices. All right, that is the takeaway on chapter two. Um, I, this would be the time that I would take questions. I just put the link to that particular page into the chat. Um, yeah, so who wants, who has any particular question they'd like to ask for those who aren't comfortable speaking, just write it into the chat and, and, and we'll, we'll find a way to enter. I see Ted. Hello. Hello. Um, so my question actually is not from this chapter. It's from mm -hmm. the, uh, now I've lost it. Uh, the second chapter introduction, I think maybe. Um, yes, the section about centering. I don't really understand the word centering, Scott. And uh, uh, there are things in that section that individually made sense, but altogether I found it, it I didn't understand stuttering very well. And, and I, I think since that seems to be the lead into everything else, I thought perhaps you might be able to clarify the term and its use for the remainder of this book. Sure, I, I would love to answer that question um, after I answer any other questions about those takeaways we just encountered. Okay. Okay, I'm not, so make sure I don't forget it because I will, um, if you don't remind me. Um, yeah, any other questions from the takeaways from the, from the governance chapter? Okay. Yeah, I see Annalise. No, I just, I just came up with one. Um, Good. So you spoke of the ch charge document or the, uh, the charge that's being written. Oh, now I for the, for the, the nominating leadership. and leadership yeah. development yeah, committee, yeah, yeah. yes, NLDC, yes. Um, and and I know that you know Revanya uh, is working on charge documents for and is encouraging charge documents for all of our groups at UUCM. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I, I guess that's that's one way to help ensure that um, these sort of informal roles um, have a less chance of success of. Um, occurring. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the question is like, so where are we with that? And um, where are we with the charge documents? And yeah, I guess that's it. Mm. So I didn't hear the question. I'm sorry. 
<laughs> yeah. So I'm I just, you know, I heard what you said, but I didn't hear a question in there. So I just want yeah, to. So, I mean, where are we as a congregation in, in creating these charge documents for the groups? I know that mm -hmm. the undoing racism group is, is working on one, but I'm just wondering if like, do we have a, a handle on how many groups have done this charge document? And, you know, I guess, I guess the question really is like, how close are we to achieving that, um, ideal that that's described yeah, in the governance sure. chapter. So, so the, so, the, you know, in, in a, so our board governance is a modified form of policy governance. And that's a bunch of big words that may not mean much. Basically the, the board's main thrusts are, are to sort of make sure that, we're, that they're making decisions to further the mission and the vision of the congregation. They have a fiscal responsibility um, to make sure that, that we're fi financially viable and healthy in that way. And, and, and among other things, they're also, um, they generate policy. They're meant to be the long-term, you know, they're not supposed to be making decisions about what color paint we're putting on the wall or who's going to staff the eighth grade classroom. They're meant to, to be making these, these large scale decisions. And that's often done with policies and sometimes procedures and others are, are charge documents. So they're, all these things are part of the, our, our, our board's manner of governance that, that lets people know when they walk onto these teams, you know, whether it's, you know, you know, the, it's, it's allies for racial equity or it's a religious education team or nominating leadership development, this is what the board expects the work to be. And, and these are the levels of accountability. These are the processes you're expected to follow. Um, uh, as far as, uh, you know, uh, data as how, how, what, what percentage of our teams and committees have, uh, encountered that, um, that uh, have written and adopted and embraced a charge document. I, I wouldn't have that, but from my, I think it's about eight. It's somewhere around that. Yeah, that's Peter's the board, the board president. So six, uh, nine, but in that number. We have yeah. That. So it, it's, we're, our goal is we really think that every group should have some kind of document like that because how else is a lay leader supposed to know what they're walking into and how it's supposed to work? You know, the details of how you make it work, you know, is up to the team, but there has to be some guardrails that, that are not just about the work, but how the work is done. That's the whole notion of this report is it's not just getting the work done. It's getting the work done in a specific way that, you know, does not promote, you know, the, the vagaries and, and damages of dominant culture and, and actually actively dismantles you know, uh, racism in the, in the process. And so it's, it's, so, so that's, so I'll, I will have no reason to think that there's any more or less than eight, if Peter says there's eight, um, um, but, uh, all right. Any other questions about those takeaways from the governance section? All right. Good. Um, so some of you have some experience with the notion of centering. I'm actually going to just put that section up. It's actually from the introduction, which is page XIX 19, Roman numeral 19. Um, and so before we start, so what there's, there's an image, a metaphor of, of leadership. Let me take down the screen share first. There's an image, there's a metaphor of leadership that suggests that dominant culture people are always in the center, expected to be in the center. Their, their um, norms, their habits, um, their preferences, their value system is centered, is, is determined to be normal, quote unquote. The norms are set by, 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 by the dominant culture customs and practices and habits. Um, and um, and what, what this thinking is, is saying is is that those who are on the margins, if you're not in the center, if your values, if your style, if your identity is not in the center, then you're on the margin st sticking with the uh, circle metaphor. And then so how do we get people who have been historically on the margins and put them into the center and, and find a way to have their intuitions and their, and their style and, and their cultural practices and their ways of doing things be what we follow, that, that they create the fabric of our of our relationship and and or of our governance and so um i will share this piece um and i don't want to go too far afield in this i can prepare a different kind of presentation on this 
um, because it's not what I prepared. So I don't want to do it badly, but I'm just going to share what's in the report, um, if that makes sense. Um, and so, uh, so, uh, so a word about centering. So the, the, the introduction talks a lot about centering those from the margins as, as a means of changing what we see to be as what is the norm. So the patterns and habits of white supremacy culture are often unacknowledged, unrecognized, even openly denied. When we understand how these patterns and habits affect those who hold power and those who are harmed by them, we then also come to understand we can't dismantle systems of oppressive behavior without leaning into the knowledge and perspective of those most affected. While proximity may not always guarantee expertise, it does guarantee experience and often greater discernment due to higher personal stakes. Honoring this experience and discernment will require that we cultivate compassion. And it would help to look at the etymology of the word compassion, meaning to, which means to, to experience or suffer with together. So what in part, what, what they're getting at here is when you, when you, place people who have his, who, whose identities have historically been on the margins into the center that these are our leaders and these are the ones who are going to tell us um, how we're how we're going to be in relationship or at least you know add, add a, a, a significant new flavor to how we're going to be in relationship it doesn't mean expertise but we will get experience not thinking we have all the answers and we have all the right ways of doing things because we've decided that we are going to follow one of the biggest lessons of dismantling white supremacy is learning how to follow and not always have to show up as the expert. It's why the, um, it's, it's, it's why in fact, um, the UU UU mediation changed final fellowship to full fellowship. That's, that's in the text because the notion of final fellowship means I'm arrived, I'm an expert, you all have to acknowledge me. And, that, and, it, and, it, and it suggests simply with the term that my development as an ordained minister is complete. And without really saying in my ordination title that I'm supposed to be a lifelong learner and keep developing and revising, right? Um, so how do we have a learning community instead of a learned community, right? How do we stop appointing people as finished complete experts that are supposed to tell us how, we're, how we do things. Let me just share another paragraph in that that I think might take us a, diff a different step. And um, in the, So the perspective offers us a, a sensitive and sophisticated understanding of the oppressions, this encounter, um, this experience with allowing others who historically haven't been centered in, in, uh, in, in power to, to, to occupy that center. Some have taken the idea of centering the leadership of black people, indigenous people, and people of color and minimized it to a simple process wherein white or white identified people express a desire for collaboration while avoiding the work that only they are in a position to do. Or even worse, they've misrepresented this suggestion to enmesh beleaguered black folks, indigenous folks, people of color within their communities into inequitable and toxic systems of labor responsibility and accountability. That's a whole lot. I'm not sure I can unpack all of that, but the notion of centering is, is, is twofold. It's a metaphor that reminds us that no matter how much we're aware of it, that there's certain ways of doing things, customs, habits, processes, you know, value systems that are, are, that are, are centered, that are, that are lifted up as being more correct, the way you're supposed to do things, um, of higher value and, and, and better result. And the notion of trying to center others from outside of that cultural um, experience is, is an attempt to get us to take a step back, to follow and to learn and experience from having a different set of values and experiences and customs be lifted up as this is how we're doing things. That's the best I can do tonight at 7.34. Is that good enough for now, Ted? Well, it's funny. Yes, it's great. Um, I think that as I as you were speaking and as I was rereading it again and again, I, I began to realize that I was I, you were using, and I think here in the text they're using centering, uh, not literally, but uh, your your metaphor of the circle and who's sort of in the leadership position at the center and how did they get there and what are they supposed to be doing. 
I was imagining centering, like when we talk, we're praying in the service, you know, and we're trying to get centered, you know, I was like, this makes oh, oh, sense. Oh. I, get I don't get it. Oh, that's an easy one. It's not that. It's more literal. <laughs> <laughs> it makes so, a lot more sense now. <laughs> yeah. Anybody who has an issue with any of these terms, because some of them, you know, obviously folks who are in this kind of study, you know, encounter these terms. Sometimes they actually invent these terms themselves, right? Um, um, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah, the terminology, uh, I think yeah. it's in the methodology page uh, was yeah. helpful too, actually. Just yeah. So, okay, thank you for that little detour, Scott, but it, I, we did gone on to governance and I really wanted to hear about that centering thing, so. Thanks. I appreciate it. Um, anytime I can do something like that in a reasonably quick way, it's a good thing. Um, all right, good. Uh, so where was I? Uh, all right. Okay, we were, we were finishing up governance and we're going to congregations and committees. All right. All right, good. That's perfect. That's exactly where I want to be. Um, let's see here. And so th this is the next chapter. Um, congregations and communities. Sorry, I said committees. Congregations and communities. Enough committees already, for goodness sake. Um, so let me share with you some of the what I... Oh, and... And make sure, I forgot to ask you this for governance. Um, if there's something in the chapter we're going over that you know you want to lift up as particularly important, please make sure we share it in this group. You know, I'm just sharing you what, I'm trying to make this as digestible as possible. And I'm going to be going at times that, that you know, I may not be giving you enough. So please, you know, if there's something in these chapters you want me to lift up, just, just please stop me in my, in my path, okay? Um, yeah, all right, so congregations and communities. So I'm going to share from James Luther Adams and, and, and being sensitive to the fact that we had a, a name change. What was it in 2005? We had the name change from, he, uh, he's famous for writing, a congregation is a place where you get to practice what it means to be human. A congregation is a place where you get to practice what it means to be human. May it be so. Um, I should always also remind you that all of these things tie into one another. And uh, you'll hear that in this one, we're talking about governance and the next one we'll be talking about, con it, it's, in, it's inevitable. They're just separated for convenience so we can digest things. Um, so my colleague, Natalie Fenimore, now out at the Shelter Rock Congregation on Long Island, she has a piece in here that begins on page 40, and I'm gonna just read a little bit of what she's writing on page 41. So she's bringing in the work of Conrad Wright. He was a, a Unitarian historian, and uh, I think he was at the White Plains Congregation, I think. Um, and he uh, wrote a lot about the history of, of, of our congregational life. And so what she shares, and she's speaking about the Cambridge platform. Um, and so what he's suggesting is that the UUA is something more than an agency to serve us. In some respects, it is actually ourselves and it provides an organ through which we may state from time to time a consensus prevailing among us so that the waywardness of particular churches may, if necessarily, be rebuked by the opinion of the whole. And that's not the way we normally think of, you know, denominational life, I think. Um, uh, but, you know, so let, let, let me finish that quote, and I'll share a, a brief story from my own experience. This is one of the things that the fellowship of the churches means in the Cambridge Platform. The local church, while it's free to make decisions, is bound to make its decisions responsibly with a decent respect for the considered judgment of the whole in line with our collective vision and mission. And so the story this reminds me of is when I was in Northern Virginia, there was a congregation to the south of us, um, and they they didn't always do things in the most accountable 
way. They were a fun bunch of folks. I mean, you went to one of their parties, you would have a blast. I mean, they knew how to throw a party. Um, and they were lovely folks, but they had a hard time with boundaries and they had a hard time following their own rules. And in Northern Virginia, a lot of our closest were very, very close to each other. They were about 12 miles from the congregation I served. There were within, within 20 miles of the congregation I served, there were some, you know, nine congregations, uh, many of them very healthy, uh, most of them very healthy. And one or two of them were constant sources of trouble, right? Um, and so there was a, a former staff member there who was a member, and this is one of the reasons we try not to hire staff who are members of a congregation, a staff member who had been hired and, and served before as a director of religious education. Well, this particular individual um, had certain appetites and she would um, you know, scope out the young men that caught her eye and, um, and have uh, inappropriate relationships uh, from her role as, as a staff member with these young men. Um, and very recently, um, before she had been fired, some five years before this incident that I'm describing, she had actually uh, hooked up with a father of four. And after um, a short affair, had encouraged this father of four to move in with her um, and thereby leaving the, the children and the wife um, without their former partner. Um, and there are all kinds of rules that make this not okay as a staff member in a religious institution. This is not a matter of consenting adults. This is a matter of transgressing a power boundary and, and disrupting the fabric of congregational life. Um, and so, um, and right on cue about eight weeks after he moved in with her, someone else walked through the door. And so she kicked him out. So it was really hard to convince that congregation to get rid of this um, a director of religious education, but they did. Um, and five years later, when they had some other conflict arise due to bad boundaries, um, they hired her again. And so I contacted the UUA and I said, we're not gonna stain the brand of our faith putting a known misconductor in a program staff position 12 miles from this congregation, what are you going to do about it? That's what I said to the people in Boston. And their first response to me was, it's not your business. So what I did next is I pulled out the Cambridge platform of church discipline. And I said, yes, it is my business. And you're the one who's, who we pay to enforce it. So I'm giving you 48 hours to tell me your plan. And I was lucky that I knew some board members of that congregation and I called them with a little charm offensive. And I said, I hear what's going on. Don't, um, you know, I love you guys, but I will not let this go until it's resolved the way it should be. And thank goodness they had enough power on that board that they kept the hire from happening. But there are too few among us. Number one, we don't know each other well enough as we should, frankly. Um, a congregation to congregation, but um, there are too few um, who are willing to make that phone call. And that's why, you know, there are ministers that, that uh, you know, prey on congregants or are abusive. That's why there are other staff members that, you know, aren't held accountable, whether for bad job performance or much worse. And it's something that we need to change. Um, and it's right in our founding congregational polity doc documents how and why we should change it. I know that was a heck of a story, but I swear it's all true. Um, all right, so let's see, what else do I wanna share with you here? Yes, there's a great piece in this that I want you to pay attention to at some point. Excuse um, me, Scott, I think yes. I a question. Oh, I'm sorry, who that? Dan. Yes, Mr. Dan. Um, yeah, maybe this isn't the time to answer this, but are we worse than other congregations and faiths in in no. in thinking about letting this person back in? No, no, ab ab absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely not. Especially, you know, when it, congregations that have, 
you know, autonomy and congregational polity, you know, they, you know, they're used to making their own decisions without expecting any oversight. But, um, you know, the hierarchical churches, you would think, should do better at this, but you've watched the news about the Catholic Church for the last 40 years. So no, I mean, this, th we are not alone. And my experience, you know, um, sexual misconduct is the primary um, well, miscon misconducting that we see. Um, about 30 years ago, there was a lot of financial misconduct, um, but I haven't seen, I actually haven't seen that, you know, um, in my time as a minister that I'm aware of. I've not been, but, but yeah, so, uh, you know, it's ours is, and we've gotten stronger over my time in the ministry of the last 14 years. We, we, we take this very seriously. And I knew that that particular person I spoke to from the UUA, that if she didn't respond to me in, in 48 hours, then um, there was someone else I would call who would ask that person why they didn't respond to me. So, so at that point in our time, we did have the support and the backup for boundary setting. So, Thank you. Um, on page 45, I'll try and bring this up for us. Uh, Rev. Scott, if I could just interject yes, please. for a minute. Um, I had my hand up, but I'm sure you didn't see it. I so I just want to, because that's a disturbing story that you just told there. Um, and I, I just wanted to kind of relate that back to the, the topic at hand a bit more directly. So I, I think the takeaway that I get from that is if it's so hard for the UUA to police something as um, sort of factual as what you were describing there, someone moving in, changing residences, then how could we hope to to police something like microaggressions or excluding people from the circle? Like, if it's that hard to do it with something that overt, you know, it, it sort of illustrates the, the problem at hand. Oh, you're on mute. I, I wish I had a gold star I could put on your little screen here, um, but that is exactly the point I wanted people to get is how difficult it is to set and enforce boundaries. It is very, very hard. Um, and those of you who work with me know that the times you've probably seen me the most upset in congregational life is when boundaries refuse to be honored because I, I, could, I have at least 15 of these stories where colleagues and colleagues of color were just, just treated in such awful ways, I, it, it, I don't even want to recall them, but I probably will when we get to that, that chapter on uh, uh, professionals of color. So, um, yeah. So what I'm going to- question. Oh, sure. Yeah. You have to be my question finder because I'm looking at the book and another screen as well. <laughs> sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Who's the question from? Oh, Ted. Okay. So if I could follow on what what Sarah just said, and I, I have on my screen here, I was looking up the, what the Cambridge platform is and reading about it a little bit. While yeah, you're yeah, yeah. And it, it, one of the things it's saying is that congregational churches should maintain communion with one another. Autonomous so, communion. That's right. That's right. Yep. I believe there is some kind of like uh, New Jersey, like Association of Unitarian Universalist Congregations, right? Like you guys kind of get together. Is that correct? Um, so congregations used to be organized in districts, geographic districts. Mm -hmm. That was changed about six years ago to regions for financial. It was changed for financial reasons. Uh, so, but now we have regions. We're part of the Central East region. Um, okay. And it's a much larger, it's much harder to have those meetings of, of so ministers meet in clusters, religious educators, musicians meet in, 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 in small clusters that are geographic. Um, the, there's UU uh, Faith Action New Jersey, which is a social justice thing, but it's not really a congregational thing. Uh, I know the congregational presidents meet, but I don't, Peter, is that geographical? I think that's nationwide, isn't it? Um, I don't know. I yeah, don't. I think it's mostly geographic. I, mean, I think it's mostly nationwide. It's just a, a listserv. Yeah. Um, we used to do more sort of, you know, district pro programming um, and, and read, you know, the smaller geographic circle programming, but there just hasn't been as much money or, or, or appetite for that recently. We did it a lot in the national capital area because there were so many of our congregations, like we could have an event and, you know, with those nine congregations within 20 miles of my former congregation, you could have a decent event with nine congregations with, you know, the youth are so much better at doing this than the adults are. Yeah, speak about that a little bit. 
So really, at, at, at you know, both at the national level and definitely at the re, you know multi-state regional level. I don't know what it's called, but mm -hmm. uh, and, and Sarah, Sarah, and some other folks here know. Um, you know, the the youth are really involved. So like Maggie had just the, my daughter, who's a freshman now at Rutgers. Um, she was so much more involved in the regional and even national level of UU than she was in our congregation. <laughs> she had a couple friends from the congregation, but they, but she's got lifelong friends from Pennsylvania, from Long Island, from wherever. Um, so the kids should be our lead in that. It works. And, and it really, um, you know, like she knows what it's like to be a UU more than I do, you know. Right. I know what it's like to be a UUCM. <laughs> UU. She knows what it's like to be a UU. Yep. You know? Good. That that's perfect. That's perfect. So you. So the. I should share that the reason that I knew that was happening in that congregation near me was because the minister told me it was happening, and she was. And the minister at the time was not able to stop it, um, and and because the minister was brand new, and knew that I knew a lot of people in that congregation. Uh, and, you know, that's why, you know, you see Reverend Anya and I trying to do more congregational initiatives with other congregations. Summit has been the, the most eager participant in that working together. Um, we've done some social justice work with them and I hope to do more of, and, you know, maybe even, uh, you know, some, and some youth programming. But, you know, it's not easy. It's hard enough to manage your own congregation, much less to do other things. I mean, you know, it, it, there's a reality there. And, and, and I get that. Right. Um, so hopefully, you know, the ministers are paying attention and they're actually talking to each other about real problems and helping each other out and holding each other accountable. So at some level, it, it really, the biggest hope is for it happening at the professional level, the ministers and the religious educators. Yeah. That's kind of what I was wondering about. Is it, it like, I mean, you know, it probably is not really going to address things like microaggressions, but no. things at the larger policy scale or, you know, I'm just wondering there's, so it sounds like there's no, mechanism or or you know written um you know like goal of these organizations and groups to i don't want to say police each other but to be that sort of uh uh unobstructed view for your for your mm -hmm. fellows in in you know in communion to say you know hey from where we stand this looks weird what you're doing and maybe you should reanalyze that it's right like, that's not really built into that organization it sounds like it's just not necessarily and 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 because of the rampant individualism of american culture you know for the last you know 150 or more years um any of those impulses uh, have been sort of beaten you know and 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 made devoid of of much power or imprint that they're barely a watermark anymore you know what i mean and so if it's not the professionals who are trained this way and who are willing to make those phone calls I'm not trying to lift myself up as somebody. I was I was mad because we were working really hard, you know, to to grow our congregation. The last thing we needed was, you know, you know, people like staining the brand of the faith. That's the word I used. And that's what it is. Um, besides doing damage to families in a religious setting, which is yeah. violence, if you ask me. But yeah. um, anyway, so I want to move back past this. We'll be coming. We'll be getting much more of this as we go on. What? How do we do this? So that's going to be a big question. All right. Um, let me share. So on page 45, you'll find, and I'll share this on your screens. Um, First Parish Malden in Massachusetts. And we've been doing some mission and vision work, you know, strategic planning. And so, so this just lifts up a nice succinct way that another congregation has done this work. Uh, and I think what I like a lot, you know, um, especially is there is the covenant of the members. Um, we pledge ourselves to hospitality, to understanding, to spiritual growth, to sharing, to participation. Um, and, you know, it, it tells us what it calls us to do. But the interesting thing to me that's missing from this is accountability. And that's always the hardest one to get into these congregational documents, right? So anyway, that's just one example of, of a congregation doing interesting thing. And, and they're not a new congregation, 1648. That's, I think that's the year they wrote the Cambridge platform, right? So they've come a long way. And, and so the other thing I would point out to you, and, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll put this page as a link, 
This is probably one of the most important things in the text for us on a congregational level. Remember, recommended congregational practices to increase equity, inclusion, and diversity. And things like appoint someone to be a liaison to the UUA, ensure that lifespan religious educator are focused on building understanding about equity and inclusion, do basic hospitality role-playing and education each year for those involved with membership and greeting activities, put money in your budget for education around anti-oppression practices, add a line item for scholarships to General Assembly and make them available to those who most need to connect around identity, you know, Black folks, Indigenous people, people of color, LGBTQ folks, uh, young adults and youth. Form justice partnerships with organization led by those most affected by the issues uh, and follow their lead. This is a way of centering, you know, the folks that we claim we want to be, uh, you know, allies with, right? Um, and let's see, I'm going to get it to here before I come to the takeaways, just for my own self. Here we go. Um, but we'll come back to that. So that page 46, you know, nice having the board president on. I think this is a uh, this is probably if we were to plop anything out of the first half of this book, it would be it would be that page 47 box. There are things the board can do easily, you know, maybe with a little bit of money here and there, but but they're not they're not big cultural changes. They're like simple operational things to make part of what we do. And we do some of them. We make um, we make scholarships to General Assembly. Uh, we 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 put money in our budget for for uh, for different types of educations we are forming partnerships with organizations led by those most affected by issues i mean all those things are part of what we do so but you know it's just important to remember that this is these are so sort of the operational things in a congregational level that we can do to promote the change that that we want i mean i was reading along with you on those and i was pretty proud that like we i feel like we could check most of those boxes most of those off Maybe a little better check them a little yep. darker but Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, for the most part, we're on track for that. So, yeah, I think, I think, you know, uh, yeah, we have a great uh, membership team. I, I it, so working in hospitality role playing, that's a very sort of granular thing to say, but it's important. And you'll see that in the next chapter about how some, you know, you know, people of color and, and, and others are treated by folks who think they're being nice to them and welcoming, welcoming them to happy hour. Um, you know, be ready to grimace um, when we get to the next chapter. Um, so I'm going to just share the, the takeaways. I am trying to move us through four chapters tonight. And if we can't, then we can't. Um, I get that, right? Um, screen share again. Takeaway. All right, let's read these again. I will call folks out. I will begin with... Uh, uh, let's see, who do I see? I see Norma Tassi. Could Norma Tassi read the first one? Congregations that choose to engage to increase equity, inclusion, and diversity are leading the way into the future. Mm -hmm. Nicole Gray. Too often, congregations must do the challenging work, must do this challenging work, by themselves when learning communities would be easy, when learning communities would be easy to form. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things that us doing so much virtual programming in the last year, I think we're gonna have an opportunity to partner a lot more with folks. Um, and one of the things you probably, you may not know about is our director of religious education, Judith Hogan, um, when she realized that she was new in this, found six partners who were seasoned directors of religious education and they're still doing programming together and and still sharing best practices it's it, we're very lucky to have her on staff um dan silver could you read the next line curated resources learning circles and funding to develop needed tools should be a priority for uua led efforts under the leadership of the religious of the liberal religious educators association. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, Nicole Rinklin. Anti-oppression tools, as well as conflict facilitation, are essential to leadership development efforts. And leader leadership development is needed in the complex and often conflictual context of leadership today. How do we continue to see conflict 
as an opportunity for learning and growth and not just something to run away from. All right, uh, next would be Ellie Bagley. Oh, unmute. None of this can be accomplished without better communication between the Unitarian Universalist Association and the congregation it serves. Mm -hmm. Ted. Regional gatherings could touch more Unitarian Universalists and help provide a common frame of reference. And Peter. Regional staff should provide a consistent structure for work on diversity, equity, and inclusion. All right, you're gonna hear those words a lot together, diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's sort of become, you know, one of the buzzwords. Often you'll see it um, simply as DEI. So just wanna make you aware of that. So Rev, Scott, when I, I often confuse um, equity and uh, um, equality. Mm -hmm. And what when I picture it, what it, what it, what I remember seeing a cartoon sometime was of like two people, one you know four foot tall and one set you know six foot tall, and there's a fence, and they both have a uh, you know the fence is maybe you know six and a half feet tall. And they both have a foot box that they're given to look over the fence, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's that's equal. It's not equitable. So, right. They both get the same size box, box. to look over the fence, but for yeah. Somebody it's helping, and for the other person, it's not doing anything. So equity is not sameness. That's the way I remember. You know, equity is trying to to level outcomes and 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 to make people's experience and encounter um, similar. But the way you get there it can't be the same for, for everybody. You can't just give everyone a one foot box to stand on and expect them to see over a seven foot fence. And, and I think I was always raised with equality and never really raised thinking about equity, just, you know. Yep, of course. Oh, and, and, you know, it wasn't, you know, there is an evolution of understanding in these issues, right? You know, and, and you know, there, there's, there wasn't even equality, right? And, and you know, so, you know, and, and so, you know, when, it's good that we keep learning. And this is, this is why we need to be a learning community and not think of ourselves as a learned community, right? And Sarah has just put a great resource into the chat. Now, um, I'm just gonna invite us to take a, a break. And I wanna get through the next two chapters if I can, because I want us I want us to spend a lot of time in the last class actually talking about what it might mean for UUCM. All right, so let's just take a break. Do what you need to do, stand up, stretch. I always have to. I'm only good for sitting for like 68 and a half minutes, if that, so. I'm taking the under on that one, Rev Scott. <laughs> Depends on how many meetings I've had in the day. And I have a nice stool. I've got a nice stool with the pneumatic like thing that raises it and lowers it. I mean, you know, it's comfy. It's meant to be, a, it's a drummer's throne. Um, so it's, it's very cushy. And even still, I can't sit still, you know. You can compare your new one, my brother's new one. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, Debbie's brother's a drummer. We always, we always talk about gear whenever I have a, the opportunity to see him. Okay. All right, good. I think we've gotten somewhere. I'm going to give you some breakout time, you know, after this, after the two more chapters. But um, let's let's just keep moving. Um, let's see. So, congregations and communities. We did governance. All right. So now we're in hospitality and collusion. One of the other things that I want to mention about the previous chapter. Um, I love, I love that they talked about developing more of a common language, and you'll see that throughout this, this report. Common languages of theology, a more of a common language of, of the justice work we do. Um, you know, 
I, I think I think we've as a faith have lost our allergy to more collective speaking. We've lost our our knee jerk reaction against you know wanting to have um, you know a, a religious life that is recognizable as 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 a religious life to someone who walks through the door, right? You know, I, that's one of the things I love about you, you Montclair, especially. When people ask me, you know, why I love, because you know, you know, I I don't just say this. Um, it's it's really very true. I mean, we're very lucky to be here. This is a good fit for Reverend Anya and I as as co-ministers. And one of the reasons it's a good fit is, is this is what I call a yes congregation. And what I mean by that is if we work hard and we're in relationship and we do our best and we try something that might be a little bit different or not to everyone's taste, they don't come to the receiving line telling us, you know, I don't want you to say, sing that song again, or I don't want you to, I mean, people appreciate the effort and they, they give us affirmation you know, even if it didn't didn't hit the right mark for them, and and, you, and because this is your congregation, you may not know this. Most congregations aren't like that. Our ministers are always told what they better not say or better not sing or how they should dress. Or I mean, it's it, you know, it's a jungle out there. I'm just saying. You know, we're we're very lucky, and I try to re remember that and tell you all that too. And and it, and it is true. And and it's sad for our colleagues that don't have a place like this to serve. Um, all right, we're going to get back at it, as it were, and um, I'm going to pull up my notes because I'm not going to pretend I remember this. Now we're going to be dealing with hospitality and inclusion. So the hospitality. All right, so this is one of those grimace chapters. Um, and here we go. Hospitality and inclusion. All right. And this relates to something that I think um, Sarah was speaking to in some ways. So what's shared in here it's on page 58 of your text in the left-hand column. And this is some really useful stuff in this, in this for, for congregational leaders. So I'm just gonna put it on the screen. Um, but it starts out with some owies as the kids like to say. So it starts out talking about microaggressions that, that I have heard <laughs> some, I've heard every one of these in a Unitarian Universalist congregation. Um, so approaching someone who may not look like me or my wife and say, where are you really from? This isn't just wrong in church, right? Um, there, was a, there was a large uh, white man in my former congregation who hounded this poor woman who was a leader. Um, and uh, she was an Indian American and he kept trying to tell her she was really Filipino. I don't know why. Um, and, um, you know, I, I guess I set a hard enough boundary that he left, but um, it wasn't what I was trying to do. I was trying to get him to transform. You must be new to Unitarian Universalism. Many people of color have told me they've heard this. Um, David Hanley has told me that he's had people come up to him and say, oh, are you new here? And he's there every Sunday as the one welcoming people. You speak English so well. Welcome, do you wanna join the racial justice team? <laughs> I just have to touch your child's hair. And I am sad to say I saw that in a congregation in Northern Virginia more than once. So this is all studies for how to deal with microaggressions. That's not the thrust of this class, but this is useful material for you to have. Um, and there's also useful material for learning, I think, for, for people of color. And I try, and I'm really glad they put this in this, in this here, in this book, um, 
because I think this is something that that you know the the staff and the membership team have to really be prepared to share with newcomers who are people of color you know in case you know to sort of just to remind them you know take care of yourself gather your people you know so anyway all these things right so i'll stop the sharing um you know some of these people of color avatars that are in this text are very 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 uh painful to read i'm going to read just a couple of quotes from the text let's see where are we page 60 So once equitable practices are introduced, this is trying to, this part of the book is trying to say, you know what? It's not that hard to do this work once you get people to realize they need to do it. And the fruits of doing this work well come quickly. So what they're sharing is from the studies is that once equitable practices are introduced, people feel welcome quickly. Engagement with a more Unitarian Universalism does not need to mean marginalization for those who are older or white identified and economically secure, but it does mean the willingness to question assumptions, learn a more inclusive version of history and adopt new practices. There's a lot to be said for adopting new practices. Um, you know, sometimes if you force yourself to do things, eventually the wisdom of why you're doing them just emerges. Um, and that's the reason for, for good procedures. That's the reason for boundaries. That's the reason for covenant. That's the reason for policy. You know, we talked about this, you know, during the civil rights movement that, you know, it doesn't matter if people's hearts and minds are ready to have, you know, uh, integrated schools. We're going to integrate the schools. And then eventually there'll be a generation of, of folks who realize that that was what we should do, right? I mean, sometimes you have to do the deed and not worry about, are people ready, right? Um, all right, so I'm gonna take us to the end of this chapter. This is a short chapter. And I'm gonna take us to the um, hospitality inclusion takeaways. Look at that, we did a chapter very briefly. All righty, and the takeaways, we're gonna read them in a different order. I'm gonna start with Sue Parenti this time. Okay, most Unitarian Universalist congregations and organization need ongoing intention, education, and structural change to be hospitable to all. Thank you. And just, now I'm I just wanted to say. Oh yes. The last point is that you know sometimes change does happen from the inside out, but sometimes mm -hmm. it happens from the outside in. Mm -hmm. Your point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, and I think, you know, one of the things you probably heard me say from the pulpit before, you know, we, it, it is immoral to place a timetable on someone else's liberation. So sometimes you just have to force the change in the practice and let people catch up. Um, all right, Nicole Rinklin, number two. A certification process for those interested in addressing racial bias and oppression is overdue. Mm. Mm -hmm. This is uh, similar to what we did with LGBTQ people uh, for what was called the welcoming congregation. I, one of the things I also hope our faith gets away from is giving names to things that don't tell you what they are. Um, the welcoming congregation program was a program of, you know, sensitizing people to how to truly welcome and embrace and honor LGBTQ people in, in their congregations. Um, so I think they're saying we need something similar for racial bias and oppression. I just hope they give it a name that actually lets you know what it's about. Um, uh, Dan Silver. I did, <clears throat> excuse me, identity-based groups such as Drum, Blue, Trust, and Equal Access could provide those from marginalized groups with needed support while longer term cultural change is happening. Mm -hmm. And then Norma Tassi and then Sarah Skelet for the last two. A 
apologize. The defunding of our national youth and young adult programs has hindered our anti-oppressive efforts and redress is necessary. And Sarah? Congregations committed to equity, inclusion, and diversity should demonstrate through this funding of travel and scholarships for Black people, Indigenous people, people of color, LGBTQIA people, disabled and poor people, as well as for youth and young adults as a regular part of annual budgets. That's right. All right, let me set up for the last one here. And, oh, that was scary. Um, all right. All right, look at this, 8.15. We will get through all five chapters tonight. All right. So this next one is living our values in the world. Living our values in the world. Let's see what the report brings about that. I'm gonna start off with a quote. Um, this is on page 67. This is from DeRay McKesson from On the Other Side of Freedom. And, and what, what DeRay writes is, protest is telling the truth in public. Sometimes protest is telling the truth to a public that isn't quite ready to hear it. Protest is in its own way, a storytelling. We use our bodies, our words, our art, and our sounds both to tell the truth about the pain we endure and to demand the justice we know is possible. It is meant to build and force a response. All right. So that's, uh, so the, obviously this particular chapter is looking at how we envision and do our justice work. One of the other chapters you, you may recall said that one way that we can do this work well is to um, one way we can do this work well is to be in partnership with people from the community affected and to follow their lead, right? So that, that's a big learning that, that we've, we've been better at over, the, over time. The, and that is in contrast to the great white savior coming and telling folks what they need and how they should need it and what they should do with it and how they should thank us for bringing it. And I think most, most of our folks, certainly our social justice minded folks and most of the folks that I, I'm, I speak with in our congregation understand that difference. Um, so there's, there's an important aspect in this, in this book, uh, in, the, in this section, and it's on page 69, page 69, I believe, yeah. And what I love about this is this, this tells us about the four levels of oppression. And this often is, is one way to share with someone who doesn't understand systemic oppression. Um, this is one way to help them understand it, I believe. Um, one of the things that I'm aware of, um, and this isn't, Unitarian Universalists, this is just people in general, is a lot of folks, and this is, this is related to the rampant individualism of American society um, as well. A lot of this stuff is related to that worship of the individual, is what I kind of call that, that whole era of our culture, um, is that if I just build one-to-one -one relationships with people who are oppressed, then, then we can solve the problems of society. But, but we know that's not enough. And, and often, you know, I, I, I will hear people in my family when I, you know, trust me, I don't talk to my family much about a lot of justice issues because it's, you know, it's, I don't see them that much. So I don't feel like arguing over all of Thanksgiving, frankly. Um, but what they'll say to me is they'll talk about their friends who are black or gay, or they'll talk about, you know, this person that they helped or this person they hired. And all that's great, but it has nothing to do with fixing the problem, right? So, you know, on a systemic societal level. So here we go. Let's see if we can bring this up. So this is the four levels of oppression. Um, so there's the personal level, you know, 
what's in our hearts? How do I think about things? What are my attitudes? Then there's the interpersonal level. How are we with each other? There's the institutional level, like how do our institutions conduct its work, which is a whole reason we're reading this report and you know, on this campaign to first pass and then embrace and enact the eighth principle of Unitarian Universalism to dismantle white supremacy in ourselves and our institutions. It's gotta be a part of how the institution is designed and is charged to act. And then the cultural level is what's outside of our particular institution or congregation. That it's all in there for you to read. There are other ways to unpack that, but it's so important to tell folks, to teach folks, you know, those simple things. You know, what's in your heart is in your heart. What's between you and another person is, is great. But what about the institution? What about the culture? Yeah, so anyway, let's keep moving on on that. Um, page 70. <clears throat> there's, there's a lot of good bits of this. Um, and one of the things that, that uh, I love in this text is how it, it tries to come straight at some of our, not some of our, but, 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 but many people's assumptions. So let me share a, a, a congregational story. We were involved in a, a, a policing reform effort in Fairfax County when I was in Virginia. And we did a two year program of race in America included about 56 humans, you know, five or six count experience um, training, you know, with organizations, you know, and I had some folks, you know, who um, were not happy that we were spending so much time and energy in that same direction. And one of the, you know, and, and, and the thing that they, the most of them, you know, tried to bring to my attention to suggest that, you know, we're missing other important things was, you know, well, what are we doing about the environment? Um, well, it, the funny, the reason that I had a weird smile when she, when this person asked me that question was it was just two weeks prior, I had talked about the intersectionality of race and environmental justice. Uh, Three weeks from then, we had you know a, a leading member of an uh, environmental organization coming and, and doing this uh, awesome talk about environmentalism in, in Virginia. And I didn't know, but I assumed, because I'd read his book, um, he talked a lot about how it affects people of color. So people often express their weariness with the generational campaign it's gonna take to, start to dismantle white supremacy by doing the what about thing, right? And um, so it, it's just important. So, so this piece in, 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 on, on page 70 deals with that directly. It says environmental justice. And, and I'm just gonna read the piece by Dr. Adam Robersmith from Cherishing Our World. Of course, Paula Cole Jones on the on the column next to it, she talks about the communities that often bear the negative historical impact of racial and ethnic seg segregation, income inequality, and limited access to resources and policymakers are the same ones that that have the the, the strongest um, negative impact of pollution and and environmental injustice. But I, but I, I chose this as it's more uplifting and 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 proclam and more of a proclamation. And, and, and Dr. Robersmith says, our theology tells us to choose faith and hope and, and deep abiding love over fear. To act from the knowledge that we will save what is of great worth and sacredness to us. So let us refuse to be made immobile by fear and despair, instead choosing one more faithful action in every moment. And so let's just look at these takeaways from this chapter. <clears throat> and then I'll ask for some questions. That's right here. And here we 
you go. All right, so let's start with, uh, let's see, Ted, then Ellie, then Annalise, then Debbie. How about that? Ted, start us off. Ooh. Our theology calls on us to respect the worth and dignity of all, and that is the foundation for our justice work. That foundation, along with our understanding that we are bound together, means that we need to center justice work in accountable partnerships. Mm -hmm. Ellie. You got us, Ellie? I keep forgetting to do that. Okay. The lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion should be applied to all areas of justice work, including climate change. That's right. And Elise. Accountable, oh, I think I'm up one. Accountable partnerships are dependent on our ability to educate ourselves and avoid microaggressions, tokenizing, and other forms of modern racism. Yes. And the last one was Debbie. Oh, there's two more, Debbie and then, and then Sue. Accountability in our justice work should be to organizations with which we have partnerships. We should not ask individual members of a particular racial or ethnic group or other groups such as transgender individuals to serve as our accountability partners. And Sue. Anti-oppression work is a necessary foundation for justice work. All right. So, a whole team, you should be very proud of yourselves. I know I am. So, here's one thing I'm gonna ask you to do. You have, are you willing to spend, or are, you, are you willing to take us to 840 tonight? And if you can drop off if you're not. Um, I'm gonna give us a breakout room, a session for about, 10 minutes, let's say 10 minutes, and we'll come back and wrap up. I'll put the questions in the chat right now. So what lessons are there so far here for these uh, takeaways for UUCM and what stories need to be told, heard, shared, affirmed? All right, I'll send you into breakout groups. And let's see, there's that many of us. So you have a chance to talk. I'll do three breakout groups and you'll sign automatically. And away we go. Anything that needs to be shared? Um. Um, there was a lot of gratitude in our room for the uh, opportunities we were all having to learn. Mm -hmm. And you're a big part of that. So there was really a lot of gratitude shown. Well, thank you, but I wasn't I wasn't asking for an attaboy, but, but well, no, but but that's <laughs> important to know that that people appreciate it. And that's what we talked about. Yeah. That was like one of the that's, things yeah. that we all concurred on. We could all connect on that, right? Okay. Truly, and you're at the center. Of it. And I, I'd add to I think our group there was a bit of a I don't want to say self -con a congratulatory for our congregation uh, yeah. that we, it seemed like we had already been implementing a lot of these takeaways in mm -hmm. the last several years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were doing a lot of work with the classes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are times I think, you know, you know, um, if there if there were, you know, 40 hours in a day, I, I would I would do these classes every day, but, but there's not. Um, all right. So any any other questions and concerns you have, you know, send them to me directly. I will send notes from tonight, um, which, you know, it's just another place that these takeaways are kept. They're also in the text and in the link. And I included Sarah's link about equity versus equality. Um, um, and, uh, and, and, and it has my page numbers on there for, for the quotes that I used. Um, I figure you guys pay me. So whatever my notes are for preparing a class belong to you anyway. So uh, here we go. Um, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna end this. This is Reverend Alice Blair Wesley. She is a very interesting figure in Unitarian Universalism. Uh, I, I, she, ended up being a really good interim minister. She was really good at understanding how congregations function well. And she was a great student of history. She 
organized what's called the Minns Lecture, M-I-N-N-S Lecture, for, for years. And a lot of her work about the Cambridge platform, about congregational polity, remains some of the best stuff that's been written in the last 50 years about it. She actually served, before I was a member there, at my very first congregation in, in Churchville, Maryland. Um, and and they and she actually helped them realize that they needed to split as a congregation um, because they had a they had a group of people that wanted a social club where they could just kind of you know talk to each other and they had another group that had children and wanted a more traditional Sunday morning experience that actually provided programming for our children um, and uh, so she's this very interesting change agent and I'm going to. I don't know who's calling me from Maryland, probably my brother um, this late at night, but he'll have to wait. So this comes from Alice Blair Wesley. And she writes, In truth, the simple, transparent, potent idea of the free church has had to be time and time and time again reconceived, reconstructed in human imagination from memories of the tradition so obscured or twisted and bent out of shape over time as to be sometimes almost gone from the world. I think in part, I think that's what I was trying to get across with the Cambridge platform discussion, how you know, we need to recover how to hold one another, not just as congregants, but as congregations, um, accountable to a higher resolve, a higher notion of, of our mission and vision. Um, thank you all. I hope I didn't can be expected here for that. Um, so I'm trying to present this again. When next week we're going to try to do chapters six through nine. I don't think we'll get through five chapters. We got through four tonight. Um, um, if you have anything from any of those chapters you want to bring up that I don't talk about that you think is very important. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye. Yep. Thank you. Bye, everybody. <laughs>